Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, we're going to talk today about reactive DDD and safely exchanging information across microservices. Um, I'm purposely not sharing my video today because there's just been a tremendous uh, load on on uh, bandwidth throughout the U.S. and and uh, Europe and I'll try to reduce the amount of bandwidth that we're using for this uh, presentation. If you could please confirm that you can hear me and confirm that you see my slides. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, so let's get started. So we're talking today about reactive DDD again, and this time safely sharing uh, or exchanging information across microservices. And I just want to say that when I say microservices, this is because um, this is a typical use of it. Um, someone mentioned earlier this week, well, does this actually apply to monoliths, absolutely. So um, you, you still want to have uh, even well-modularized monoliths sharing information safely through uh, loose coupling and, and uh, temporal decoupling and, and so forth. So um, all of the information that I'm gonna provide today applies to that. So this is me. Um, I've uh, been working on the Blingo platform for more than two years, and I've managed to build a team of both uh, uh, contributors and maintainers who are, um, you know, working on their own time and contributed very well to the to the platform. But uh, also, I now have uh, hired a team of of uh, developers, and so we're uh, several of us working full time on uh, Blingo and all the uh, features that you're going to see. So Reactive, uh, if you've joined me in previous presentations, Reactive has these characteristics. It's primarily message driven. Because of being message driven, it can be more resilient, more elastic, more responsive, um, and we're going to focus today mainly on message-driven. So um, as far as Vlingo goes in meeting the reactive properties or characteristics in a single service, as in a single JVM or a single Windows process or uh, .NET process, it's, it's not only DDD friendly in terms of the API and the features that are provided, but it's also a reactive platform in that every single part of Vlingo is based on non-blocking reactive. So whatever feature you're using in Blingo is considered non-blocking and reactive, bar one. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit later, but uh, this is, a component that we call Blingo Scooter, which uh, uh, you know is sort of a very introductory way to start using some of the features with Blingo, but minus an async domain model. So you can actually use your domain model in a familiar repository, but have the other components around the domain model working uh, reactively. Okay, uh, I think that this is a bit of a compromise because um, you know, when you're working re with Reactive, it should be Reactive through and through, but it still is a way to jumpstart and have some comfort around what you're used to and plug in Reactive in other places besides the domain model and uh, feel more comfortable. At least getting to some experience with uh, Lingo um, and then adding in asynchrony or reactive 
as you become more familiar with it. So for now, though, let's just consider Lingo as a fully reactive platform. And so we are focusing on reactive is uh, message driven. So this is the point today. Of course, actors are message driven, but what about outside a bounded context? If we consider that a bounded context is a microservice, not necessarily always the case that a bounded context is a microservice, but if we are using the bounded context as a means to uh, implement microservices, then multiple bounded contexts will be at play and they need to communicate with each other. Now, if you're working in a monolith, you can still have the same architecture, but it's just that each of the services will be internally uh, hosted by a single container. And that container is just that. It is just a container. You can still have these services running on multiple threads um, as they talk to each other and as they perform their individual uh, use case tasks. So think of this as a microservices architecture. The directory that you see in blue is uh, registration and discovery. So each service registers its presence with the directory and every other service discovers other services uh, that it depends on through um, the broadcasting of directory information. Let's say that we have a use case where a rate domain object, this circular representation is for an actor. So this is a reactive domain object. Let's call it an aggregate or an entity for the sake of the uh, example here. The rate receives some sort of request, as in a command is received by the rate. That command is received asynchronously, and the rate, if the command is valid at this point in time, will apply and emit an event from itself. This is an event sourced example and as you see the rate is uh, extends the event sourced abstract base type so it gets a lot of information or a lot of functionality for free out of extending the event sourced base class in fact it gets enough uh, features that the event sourced base type will actually send its stream asynchronously and without the the um, rate aggregate or entity having to know about this and the rate is simply uh, the rate entity is simply uh, basically suspended until we have a confirmed acid transaction in a journal for building up that stream for the rate. And as you can see there, we have a journal table, um, which is just one implementation in, in case we're using um, uh, JDBC or SQL, you know, a, a relational database of any kind. But actually, uh, the table could represent any sort of storage. Okay, so basically we are persisting streams of events into a journal. Every single individual entity, such as a rate, will have its own stream, but all streams of all uh, entities are, pers are persisted into the journal atomically. Okay, so that's our first uh, use case. Now, you notice that before that the rate service had a dependency on the risk service. 
So let's say that after this use case takes place where a, uh, a rate is going to be calculated, in the rate service, you see that circular C, this is some kind of client. So let's say that C um, object has seen our own rate service domain event that was emitted out of the, the rate um, uh, entity. Now that client in seeing that event knows that it must contact the risk service. In this case, we would say that the risk service is actually upstream, even though positionally in this diagram, it appears to be downstream, but logically it's upstream. And the risk service requires clients to use its service through HTTP. Uh, this may not be our favorite way of addressing this, but we are using now um, basically a, an orchestrated process where the rate service is handling its own process of, okay, I saw my own domain event that requires me to talk to the risk service. So it makes a request to the risk service. The risk service at the upper um, left of that bounded context or microservice node, you see an R. That is an HTTP resource or a REST resource. This is a simple class that is actually backed by actors and it is fully asynchronous using Glingo. This resource then delegates to the domain model. The E in the middle is an entity. So this, let's say, is some sort of risk calculator. And the risk calculator emits an event that goes into the journal. That's the J object, which is also a reactive actor that is receiving uh, persistence requests on an ongoing basis. And that event is persisted into the journal. And then after that event is persisted into the journal, there's some sort of stream, let's say. That's the X actor. There's some sort of stream that is a reactive stream that is listening for all new events. And it is going to take all the new events and stream them into an exchange or topic such as Kafka, um, RabbitMQ, you know, uh, SNS, um, you know, just name your, your uh, exchange or streaming um, message service. Um, yes, the I just got a question from Dom. Uh, is the journal a DB inside? Yes. And it's some kind of DB. It could be, you know, any number of actual physical, you know, uh, product implementations of a database. Um, but let's not, you know, go into the actual implementation right here. That, so I'd like to stay logical at this point. Thanks for the question. Um, so now we're, we're using the exchange um, to publish our domain events from the risk service. And now the uh, rate service, which the S is a subscriber to that topic, and the subscriber sees every domain event from the risk service in the order in which it occurred. The subscriber then turns that domain event or translates that domain event into a command. That is the blue represent, uh, object representation uh, there above the subscriber and going to yet another entity. So now, we are completely message-driven, asynchronously message-driven, even across uh, separate processes, microservices, okay? So this is an event-driven architecture with uh, a sort of simple orchestration going on between the rate service and the risk service. You could say that the client is also, as in the 
the actor with the C in it in the rate service, you could say that that is also the subscriber, but we're showing them logically separate. Um, but it could be that that, that, that same uh, component is, is handling uh, that sort of round trip as, a, as a, an orchestrator, right? So just to explain the rate and risk, let's say that this is an insurance industry. And uh, just to explain what we're doing, we have a rating service that if uh, someone is, is, uh, is interested in purchasing a policy from the insurance company, they will use, uh, they will submit an application with the kinds of, uh, with the kind of insurance that they're trying to get. And when they submit that application, the rate service will somehow be uh, utilized to calculate a rate for the insurance policy. And that rate, as in how much that policy will cost over a year or some time frame, um, the risk will be calculated in the risk service and it will then base its pricing on the risk. It's not just an arbitrary calculation. Okay, the, the J in the risk service, uh, down at the right corner in the risk service, stands for journal. This would be like an event journal or an event store. Um, and I'll just explain a bit why we differentiate uh, between event store and journal. And that is because actually um, we, we often want to journal other kinds of sources, not just domain events. Okay. So you, you can be event sourced, certainly, and that may be the primary use. But for example, the orchestrator in the rate service may be command sourced. So it sees an event from its own rate service, which causes it to send the, this, uh, to, to talk HTTP down to the risk service, well, it may emit a command that causes that HTTP request to be made. And that command would be also saved into the rate service journal. And then if that orchestrator has to be reconstituted, it can be reconstituted from its command stream rather than it's um, rather than an event stream. But that's sort of an arbitrary thing at a 30,000 foot view. It's really just some sort of source, okay? Thanks for the question, Johnny. So, yep, rate service and risk service are all about financial services as in um, insurance, okay. Okay, so now what we have is a, a potential problem. And as I've discussed a few times, you know, here's the CIO or executive management of some kind in the IT area saying, okay, this whole, you know, all this streaming of events and other messages all around is, is wonderful, but who depends on what? Like if a service fails, if a microservice fails somewhere, what's, what is going to break across the entire enterprise? And if something changes in version along the way, what's going to happen at that point? So what we're going to do then is introduce the concept of a schema registry. The schema registry uh, can hold commands. Those are the blue uh, types that are shown in the schema registry. It can hold and maintain events, which are orange. It can hold and maintain documents, which are white. And these might be documents such as are used for uh, query results. So this is where we're, we're sort of headed. While inside a given bounded context, 
actors will talk to themselves in the protocols of the ubiquitous language. So the protocols that are exchanged inside a domain model or inside a bounded context uh, are the ubiquitous language of that context. But outside this bounded context should have a published language. This is a language, whether it is an international standard, an industrial standard, a national standard, or just a, an organizational standard, is established by creating a, a context of the published language that is spoken by this bounded context. Okay, I'm going to hold the other questions until um, we're further in the, the uh, presentation here. So in Vlingo Schemata, you can see that here's an example of um, a schema area. So let's say that the name, the full namespace of this particular uh, set of schemas is done by me. This is a fictitious company that I use in uh, training. It's done by me peer-to-peer, um, uh, -peer or per, um, it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer economy. So that's the second segment. So the, the done by me is an organizational name. The P2P is a unit name, so like a business division or some sort of department or something inside done by me. So this is the peer-to-peer -peer economy uh, unit. And then under that is the context name. So matching is a bounded context. And matching has events, and the events is yet another level. This is a type. And then under events are the actual schemas for the events that are published in the published language of done by me, peer-to-peer -peer matching. Okay. And as you can see there, the uh, proposal submitted event has three versions. The proposal submitted has the original version 1.0.0. It has version 1.1.0 and version 2.0.0. Okay. And the way that we use semantic versioning is we say that if the major version, that is the first number, if the major version is the same between any two versions of proposal submitted, then 1.1.0 must be backward compatible with 1.0.0, okay? If you have a breaking change, and it's not always necessary to make breaking changes, but if you have a breaking change, you can introduce that by incrementing the major version. So 2.0.0 represents a breaking change or potentially a very large redesign of proposal submitted. An example of this is what if proposal submitted had information that was considered uh, private and then we start to comply with GDPR and we have to make some breaking changes to the proposal submitted uh, payload or definition. Well, that's, that's the kind of change that might be represented by proposal submitted. If you look down the list here a bit, of uh, of domain events, notice that there's also a status for any kind of schema. So for example, proposal pricing verified is published at 1.0.0. This means that it is golden, right? After you have published a version, it's fixed. It can be deprecated it can actually be removed later after a suitable time of deprecation, but this is considered you cannot now make changes 
to the definition of proposal pricing verified, okay? And then notice uh, we have others that are in published mode. We, we have statuses of draft, which means this is an initial experimental or development level um, definition of this schema. And dependence, other bounded contexts that are dependent on that uh, domain event can then consume that, but with the understanding that it's in draft mode and the definition may change, which would break the consumers, potentially break the consumers, um, but it just basically calls out and says, this is currently a moving target, but here you can start using it. You can then move from draft to published, and that tells all consumers, this is golden, okay? Now, another advantage of Lingo Schemata as a schema registry is that not only do we make it possible for others to consume our schemas from a given context, but we can also support the knowledge that we know who is dependent on us. So the CIO or VP of you know, IT or whatever it is has this warm fuzzy feeling saying, now I know who's dependent on what. And so for example, we, get, we make a change to proposal submitted, either it falls under 1.1.0 or advances later to 2.0.0, we can inform all consumers of that domain event that, there ha that this event has been uh, updated or you know, changed in its definition. So they can be alerted and make a decision. For example, well, if it's 1.1.0 and we're not interested in those changes, we can continue to support 1.0.0 or we could simply uh, change our build file to, to say that we're now dependent on 1.1.0, okay? So I think you get an idea of how this works in general. And now what we're going to do is switch to Wolfgang Werner, uh, Wolfgang Werner. And he's going to uh, demonstrate the use of Lingo Schemata for you. So we're going to switch over to him now. OK. Hi there. Um, thanks, Juan. Um... Yeah, one already pretty much told you what the schema registry should do. And um, now I'm going to show you what our current implementation of Lingo Schemata actually does. So we're going to play through this and I'll give you some pointers um, where the stuff hangs around on the net and you can try it again for yourself. Okay, so the first thing is uh, we want to get up and running with a schema registry and the easiest way to do so is uh, to just grab our Docker image and um, you can see it here uh, and and run it. I'm just gonna copy the first snippet from the, oh no, I'm not gonna copy it because it's line broken. Anyway, um, yeah, we just run uh, the Lingo Schemata Docker image. Docker run. Oh man, I can type when people are watching. Uh, we're gonna map the port um, this is the standard um, development port it runs on 1919, uh, map this to our local port. Um, we tell the Docker image um, by passing in an environment variable um, that we want to run with the dev profile. There are other profiles and one, and you can um, change additional uh, configuration properties using environment variables, obviously. Um, yeah, and it's under Lingo, the Lingo organization, Lingo Schemata. Um, here we go. Um, yeah, now the server is there. So uh, you notice that uh, it's pretty quick to start up. And um, let's see how it looks like. Need a browser here. Okay, should run on localhost 1919. And here we go. Now this looks pretty empty. Um, we have a main view here in which we can browse our existing schema um, hierarchy. And as Juan told you, um, we have this um, hierarchy. We have the organization, 
the unit, the bounded context, the schema, and below that the schema version, which contain the actual, uh, which contains the actual schema definition. Um, yeah, we can create it using the interface, um, but that's kind of boring. Let's do it anyway. My unit. You notice I I'm now jumping through the hierarchy from top to bottom. Um, I can give it a namespace um, for our bounded context. My unit context one. I'll just put in an empty description. Um, okay. Uh, when I'm creating a schema, now this is where it gets a little interesting. Um, we can uh, select the um, the category uh, one talked about. Like, let's just build an event. And we can also select the scope, whether um, the schema should be public or just private within my uh, within my scope. Um, and after that, we're good to create a schema version, which contains the actual specification. For the previous version, I'll put in 000, zero here. Um, we have no previous version. That's by convention, the first version. Um, we can put in a more detailed description here. This actually supports uh, Markdown um, with a kind of nice editor, as I find. Um, we could put in code samples here. Oh, let's see. And quotes, I don't know. I usually use um, ASCII doc, so probably that's not entirely correct. And for the specification, um, we use our um, own DSL for defining schema. That's, for example, my event foo. And let's just give it a, let's make it very simple. Uh, let's just give it a string field called bar and give it a default value of buzz, whatever. And now uh, we can create the schema. And now if we hop back to the main view, we can see what we created here. We have the organization, the unit, the context. Hey Wolfgang, the schema. your voice just disappeared. Okay. Um, is it better now? Hmm. No, that sucks. Okay, you're back. Well, you're back now. Okay. Okay, good. So hopefully this was just a glitch in case it wasn't and I'm breaking up again. We will record this afterwards if something goes bad and um, upload it somewhere so you can have a look afterwards. Um, if it happens, my apologies in advance. Okay. Um, now we can look at what we've just created using the UI. Um, we have this event, we have the description, we can preview the description in, um, yeah, how it would look uh, rendered in Markdown. And um, now from the specification alone, we can we can do really much with it. So we want to generate source code from it and we can do it using the UI here as well. Um, note that we currently only support um, Java code, um, but we're working on a pluggable, um, pluggable code generator mechanism um, that uh, will be extended. I think the top priorities for us is to support C Sharp. Um, one, I don't know, there were others that you wanted to support, um, but um, I think the, the next one will be C Sharp, but we'll probably also provide a simple template-based um, code generator. So this should be extensible quite easily later on. Currently, we generate um, Java code using the Java Poet, the, the awesome Java Poet library. Okay, now this is all very nice, but uh, we don't want to have our developers like log into the web UI and click around and copy code to their IDEs. I think that's not what we want to do. Um, and this is why we um, created a Maven plugin that helps you <clears throat> to integrate um, your build processes um, with the schema registry. Um, everything we did um, using the UI now is also available um, via the HTTP API. 
So the front end is basically just a single page app that talks to the same um, HTTP API that you can use in your own automation tools as well. Um, and we prepared an example to show you how to talk to the um, how to talk to the API and how to set up a Maven build that um, talks to Schemata. And um, let me just quickly share the link. I'll, I'll post all the links in the um, in the in the chat afterwards so you can play with it. Um, and what we're going to do now is basically walk through this example. <clears throat> You find it on GitHub, Blingo examples under the Blingo Schemata integration subdirectory. Um, yeah, and um, once you clone this, um, you'll see something like that. Not like that, but like that. So we have two projects in here, one a producer and a consumer. The producer will um, push Schemata to the registry and the consumer will uh, read them from the, will read the code generated um, from the schemata and put them into the local source tree. Um, to get started with the example, we need to uh, create some master data and we won't create this um, using the UI, but using the HTTP API um, for now. Um, in the example, we have a shell script that does so and a, an .http file to use with um, IntelliJ, but I'll just call the script that seeds the master data here. <clears throat> so we just pushed something to the UI, and let's see how it looks like now. Um, we now have lingo in here, we have examples, we have a namespace example schemata. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and we have two schemas in there. Um, but we don't have a schema version yet. And um, when we go back to the IDE and look into the producer example, we see in source main lingo schemata um, that there are some VSS files, which is the default extension for like lingo schemata specification that we use. And um, we have a schema here, uh, the schema defined and the schema published, those two that you already saw just uh, in the UI, and um, you can see here some features of what we support um, in our DSL. We have some uh, computer types which um, evaluate to something useful, like for example, the timestamp occurred on um, evaluates to system current time release. Um, the event type um, uh, evaluates to event. The version evaluates to uh, an integer that can be easily compared and that is generated from the semantic version. We have a string field with a default value and we have a string array with default values. We have an int field with a default value here. Okay, and you see, when we look in the consumer, you see that it's not building currently. And this is because, because there's a test in there that refers to these schemata but it doesn't have them yet. So the test does not compile. So when we look at what, what, the, what the producer will do now is when I, when I run the build, it will just um, take the schema files and push them to the registry, as you might have guessed. Um, and the configuration in the POM looks like this. So we have what um, we, we need to, um, we need to, define where we can reach our schema service or uh, our API um, and we need to define which schema we want to consume uh, or we want to push in this case so we're the producer right now and you see the this is the reference that one shot in the uh, showed in the example previously you have the organization the unit the namespace uh, the schema and the version and um, we say which file contains the actual specification and in case we do an update to a previous version we need to specify the previous version um, in case we uh, want to support um, two streams like the one one dot something stream and the two dot something stream um, but these are all these default to sensible values so normally you can just do it like that you can just put in the um, 
the reference and for the rest it finds reasonable defaults. Um, it's described in detail in the Schemata plugin and um, in our docs. Okay, now enough talk. <clears throat> Let's go to the producer and um, I'm gonna run a Maven clean so you see that I'm not cheating. Um, okay, and now I'm running Maven install. Um, by default, the push um, goal um, binds to Maven install, which kind of makes sense. And if I run this, you see something here, um, installing blah, 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 pushing lingo example something to somewhere. Okay, successfully pushed and successfully pushed again. So let's hop over to the UI and see what happens here. What happened here? Let's see. Okay, we have something here now. Yeah, you see, this is what just came from the source tree. Um, yeah, that's basically it here. Um, if we go to the to the consumer right now, <clears throat> um, you see, we refer to those schema. It doesn't have them yet, so it doesn't compile. Um, so let's go to the consumer. Um, clean again. And we can run a Maven test just to prove I'm not cheating. Okay, and we run the Maven test and we see here now something with um, regards to schemata, retrieving version, blah, blah, blah. And we see a warning. One already told you that um, we have this, this life cycle, a draft, published, deprecated, removed. And um, yeah, we, we get warned that we shouldn't use it in production because that's still a draft. Um, yeah, what happened is so now it magically went from red to not red. And um, if we go to here, we see that we have now full resources that we just previously, like we uh, did in the, using the UI. And it's put into um, generated sources. And yeah, that's basically it for the, for the happy path. Now, if we want to get rid of the, um, of the warnings, we need to step through the life cycle. And let's say, yeah, this is fine now. And we want to publish this. Okay. And um, if we run our test again, <clears throat> and we see that one warning is gone, the other one is still there. See, for the first one, the warning is done for the second one, it's still there. Okay, so that's great. Now, um, when we talk about semantic versioning, um, we not only want to make sure that the client knows what he's got to expect when he pulls a new, I don't know, a new major minor patch version, but we also want to make sure that you as a producer um, have a safety net as not to push something that will break clients without noticing. So um, Schemata actually validates the schema you push um, in regard to the semantic version you put in and tells you whether it's compatible or not. So that's an additional safety net for you. And we can use this in the UI, for example. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll show it in the UI right now. So um, let's take this one, yeah. I'll just copy the existing specification. I hop over here to the schema version. It knows where I am from the context. So it already has my like the correct organization selected and stuff. Um, you also see that um, the Maven plugin put in some useful description from which project it was pushed at which point in time. So that might help in the future. And um, yeah, I can put in a new specification now and I'll change some things here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm lazy, the type T, the timestamp on, the event version B, and I'll remove this one and make this along, for example. And now I'll try to create this one um, while saying, okay, I have had the version 001, 
and now I want to have the version 002. And obviously the changes I made are not compatible, so something bad should happen now. And let's click create and actually, yeah, it does. And it shows me some nice summary what went wrong. Um, so I think I can close this one so we'll see that, yeah. So first we have a line, a line diff here, which tells exactly what changed. Um, and we have the semantic diff here, which says in the first line, okay, the type schema defined changed to change schema defined type int change to long we added the field t on and v and we removed the field event type blah 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 occurred on event version and so on and so forth okay so we can save this but if we create a new major version then we can <clears throat> and let's see now we've created a new major version <clears throat> with the new code um, get some different code out there. Um, we could have done all this um, using the Maven plug in this road. <coughs> um, I don't think I'll show it right now. <laughs> Sorry. It's pretty straightforward. It's just hop into the palm of the producer um, and change the version we want to publish here and the uh, specification source file and uh, the previous version. Okay. So that's basically what I wanted to show. Let me see if I missed something. Yeah, we can further step through the life cycle. Um, because one thing I haven't shown yet, but it's kind of well, kind of obvious that it should happen. Um, let's go and um, well, let's let's keep using this schema but uh, the schema version, but let's just change the life cycle once again of this draft version. Let's deprecate it. Um, if we deprecate it, then we'll get the warning in the build again. And if we remove it, then the sensible thing for the build to do is to break. And let's see that it actually does. Okay. And here we go now. We broke our build by using the outdated version, and we could fix it now. The consumer could fix it now by using the new version. And then, um, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Oh no, it's wrong. Yeah. Okay. There is um, there is one validation that is not kicking in, but should. Uh, I changed the schema name, and uh, now the reference is outdated, so there's a validation that should be in there. But anyway, you saw that it pulled the new version here. Um, yeah, that's it. That's how you want to you want to go about it. Okay. Um, in case you're interested to dig in deeper. I've prepared some links for you that I'll just put into the chat right now. <clears throat> if I manage to do so. Okay, one already. Oh, oh that's does not support markdown. I'll try it again a little nicer. Uh, and what I wanted to say also is that um, if you play around and if you find issues please don't hesitate to put in some uh, i'm sorry the chat doesn't like line breaks i'm sorry I, I think you'll figure it out um yeah um if you want to play around it you, if you find issues please do not hesitate to um open a github issue or even better open a pull request that makes it do something that you want it to do or if you want to talk about it just um I put in our um, my Twitter handle and the one of Lingo I O. I guess you already all follow Juan, so I didn't put that in. Um, feel free to get in touch. Um, we'd love to talk um, to you about what you want to uh, see in the schema registry. Yeah, thanks for having me. And are there any questions?
Okay. Does not look like that. Um, Vaughn, are you still there? Yes, I'm here, Wolfgang. Thank you. Um, so just briefly, let me see here. Um, we did have a few questions. Actually, why don't you, can can you, um, let's see, maybe I have to make you the presenter again, but. Uh, I don't see the questions. Uh, I, I look... Oh, good, good. So you, you still have your mic available. So uh, the question is from Stefane Blanc. I hope I say your name correctly. I apologize if not. Um, in Schemata, how do we know which client uses which version of our schemas? So uh, that, that is a feature that is, is not implemented yet, but is going in um, very soon. Like you know, next, it is the next big yeah. thing. Wolfgang, you wanna and, talk about that? Yeah, the 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 model that we will implement is that um, uh, you have seen, perhaps you've seen in the in the POM files um, from the uh, uh, from the, the, the example projects that um, when we configured the um, the connection to the to the schemata service that we put in a client organization, um, so this is basically the organization that owns the consuming project and we'll put that in whenever a schema a schema is pulled um then we'll record that dependency within schemata and um if you pull it using the ui or um use a schema that um, uses nested types you can also use a schema within a schema um then we will record that dependency as well based on your login credentials on your basically on your user context but it's not yet implemented, but on the list and an important thing to do. And we'll visualize it uh, in the UI probably with a graph or something. Okay, thanks Wolfgang. Um, I wanna go back to just a few questions, not really related to the schema registry, but more about the orchestration. So um, what you'll want to look at uh, one, Arenu, um, you'll you'll want to look at this component. This is a repository and a and a jar file, and uh, look at processes. So this is an orchestrator, and uh, there there are all kinds of ways to manage uh, the SLAs. Like for example, when do we know that the workflow succeeded? Well, that would be the re, the process receiving some domain event that. Uh, concludes the process, for example. And what about SLAs? Well, um, you can request a uh, for a timed signal to be sent to you at some future point in time that says if the workflow is not finished by this point, then uh, it's invalid. Um, for James King, uh, you asked, I understand commands are emitted and events are consumed, but both are message events. So what I'm, what I was talking about with the workflow and let me just uh, switch back here. So what I'm saying in this diagram is that a process manager is sort of the inverse of an aggregate, a typical DDD aggregate. You, uh, it's just a, it's just a viewpoint, right? And the viewpoint is that the process um, sees events and it emits commands because it's saying, "This happened. I need this happen to." I need this to happen next. That's the viewpoint of an orchestrator. And that is a process manager, uh, also known as Saga, okay? Um, 
So the C here in the rate service represents a client, but maybe it's it's really an orchestrator. It sees our own rate service in event internally because it's listening for our own events. And when it hears that some event happened, like for example, uh, application received or rate um, rate requested, it sees the rate requested. And it has to ask the risk service, what are the risks on this specific applicant and application? So it's going to emit a command, and that command is what uh, goes to the HTTP, across HTTP to the risk service. Okay. But then when the round trip happens from the risk service through the exchange, the domain event is going to be seen by the orchestrator. I'm calling it the S, the subscriber there, but really the S and the C are the same component, let's say. And, the, and so the orchestrator sees the event and it emits a command that tells an entity in the rate service, do this now. That's, and so the orchestrator sees events, consumes events and emits commands and the E entity as in a normal domain model entity or aggregate sees commands and emits events. So it's just a sort of a juxtaposition because it's, it's a matter of what your role is and the role of an entity or an aggregate is to react to commands and emit events, whereas the, the role of an orchestrator is to see what happened a la domain events and emit what needs to happen next. So um, hope that clears things up. I just want to say something while um, I'm at it. I, if you go to iddworkshop.com, you'll see that I'm going to be teaching a series of um, like half day workshops. These are all online and the cost is quite minimal. It's, it's $150 per workshop with limited seating. Um, on, on April 8th, I'm going to be teaching uh, domain modeling with entities. On the 15th, domain modeling with value objects, so a deep dive on both of those subjects, and then domain modeling with aggregates, so putting those event, uh, entities and, and value objects together, and also looking at persistence and uh, how events are emitted and so forth. And then domain events, messaging patterns, and safe information exchange. This is where I will take a deep dive into process manager and things like that. Um, and then May 6th, really simple functional domain-driven design. So functional programming at uh, a very, very simple level, as in not that it's not useful, not that it's too easy to be useful, as in get work done, and use a functional approach. And this is what I'll be teaching on May 6th. May 13th is a uh, um, really simple reactive domain-driven design. So this is where we'll get into a deeper dive on using uh, Blingo with Java and C Sharp. And then uh, May 20th, really simple event-driven REST API. So this is where we'll change the uh, position to more of how do we do everything with REST rather than uh, worrying about, you know, maybe using some kind of uh, messaging mechanism between bounded contexts. Okay. So uh, this being a webinar, right, it's, it's, it's limited in the amount of detail that we can provide. So uh, if you want to sign up for one of these, it's just $150 per half day session. Okay. Um, Okay, let me see. Um, one, I just saw that um, um, I think the message with the links did not reach all the attendees, only you. So I'm going to put uh, in another link. Um, perhaps you can share it with the group for anyone who wants to follow up on this. Okay, this is the last good. One. Thanks.
Okay, there's a link to the information that uh, Wolfgang was, was trying to provide. So I again, a question uh, about how do we know which versions? I think that was answered, which versions clients depend on. Um, Let me see. I'm just quickly reviewing questions to see if we've already covered them or if I can answer them. Um, so the question is, how would we use two versions concurrently? Um, so one thing that you have to understand is in your bounded context, you will have to choose what your event versions are. It's possible to make some events backward compatible and and emit multiple versions but if you go to a breaking version you pretty much have to cut the the ties to before and you just say we are no longer publishing 1.1.0 we are now publishing 2.0.0 and that's what you have to do but with uh, backward compatibility in in a same major version then you don't have any breaking changes and so 1.1.0 rep actually represents a fully consumable 1.0.0, okay? Um, so that's Um, Johnny asks, did you plan to integrate ske the schema definition with the operation definition and actor definition? Um, so let me, I think I know what you mean, Johnny. I think what you mean is what about internal events versus external events? Can you give me a, a yes or no? Is that what you were talking about, Johnny? Oh, no, um, okay. Yeah, it makes not being able to converse makes it a little tricky to understand. Um, well, I'll move on if you think you can explain it better. Okay, thanks Dom for joining us. Oh, uh, so how does the client, how does the consumer know that the version changed? This is part of um, what we have to implement. So basically, message it, as in, you know, emails, you know, SMS, whatever kinds of messaging that uh, the consumer team signs up for, they will be alerted based on those. Okay, one, or I'll say one. Thank you. Um, oh, Wisdle. Um, okay, is a schema an operation? Oh, so yes, you can you can define commands in the schema registry. I um, let me go back to the slides here. Uh, yeah, I don't show that, but actually, if you look on the documentation, let me just. Uh, find the documentation here. If you look at the documentation, you will see that the schema registry supports commands, data, which is just generic data that can be used inside commands, inside documents, inside events, and so forth. So these are, these are sort of the, the high level types that you can have. Documents are like, query results. Um, you can even have envelopes, like if we want to wrap an envelope around an event or a command or whatever it happens to be for some sort of metadata. But yes, so you can you can define command schemas inside. Does that hopefully answer your question? 
Oh, okay. Swagger. Let me get to um, a latter part in the presentation. So a future, I just wanted to mention that, that uh, Petru will be giving uh, a presentation about Blingo Symbio in the future. He's one of our team members. Um, and he'll be talking about object store, state store, which is a key value store, and the journal. So um, diverse reactive storage engines, okay? And, and yes, all reactive, all asynchronous. And uh, in a few weeks, Danilo will provide um, a presentation on Blingo Zoom, which is our, you know, quick start boot micro framework. And, uh, and just to, to, you know, bring this all together, um, Blingo Zoom now supports Kubernetes. So we have cloud scale resiliency. Uh, if, a, if a node crashes within your uh, rate service cluster, that node is recovered very quickly. And uh, this fits in with last week's presentation, which we will finally get online very soon on, on YouTube. But what I want to mention about Blingo Zoom is if you look at Blingo Zoom, we support Open API or Swagger. Um, so you can take an existing uh, set of endpoints um, that, that you create with Blingo HTTP uh, with Blingo Zoom, right? So you're, you're working in Zoom. And then you can ask the uh, service for its API, and it will generate the, the open API definition for you for all of, all, of the, uh, all of the endpoints. We are going to be doing a round trip on that, uh, but we haven't gotten to it yet. But yes, we will be supporting that. Um, hopefully that helps. So currently it's only reverse engineering to um, open API, but we will be forward engineering to open API. So you'll have full round trip. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so great question. Is it possible to have custom implementations of the schema not auto-generated? Yes, we are going to support that. Um, and it's just not there yet, but yes, uh, if you would like to contribute, help with that, that would be great. Um, so note that the definition language itself, um, the VS, the .vss is not Java. It is a DSL that is just specifically neutral. We will also be supporting in the future, like, um, you know, different, actual different definition languages such as uh, protobuf and so forth. Okay, so, um, okay. Okay, great. Um, and yes, Java is, is the generated code that we, that we produce now but it's not limited to Java. So our next step is to uh, generate C Sharp. Actually, the generation is fairly trivial when you, you know, know that you have a valid um, abstract syntax tree. And so we can support any of that. We'll probably create a templating interface so that, so that you can even follow the sort of, you know, style guides or whatever that your team uses. So we'll be doing that as well. Okay, great. Well, um, any last questions for you, from you? And we can try to answer. Uh, so the documentation is here, docs.blingo.io. And you, know, you have your table of contents here, but specifically Lingo Schemata is at slash Lingo dash schemata, okay? And, and then also uh, remember to sign up. I'm gonna be doing you know, the deep dive thing. So we're gonna go into ubiquitous language in 
entities, value objects, um, aggregates, um, with domain events, messaging patterns between more detail on the safe information exchange uh, that we went into today, actually how to implement that. And then really simple functional domain-driven design, um, really simple reactive domain-driven design, and really simple event-driven REST APIs. That's all at uh, IDDD Workshop. And we will most likely be holding uh, two times. One would be a European-friendly time, and one would be a US-friendly time. Um, don't know if we would be able to cover other time zones, but that's also possible. So we will probably be uh, doing like a, you know, what would be like a 2 p.m. or a 1400 hours in Europe and uh, and then like an 11 or, well, somewhere in the United States would be uh, anywhere from uh, 1400 in the afternoon back to 1100 uh, in the morning. Okay. Thank you all very much for attending. And if you want to review this again, you'll see it out on GitHub, uh, hopefully within a few hours or by tomorrow. Okay. And also look for last webinar re recorded. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. We'll catch you next time. Thanks all. Bye.